Hi, Kevin Martin here, your UT admissions guy, joining you for the second installment on the Fisher vs. UT case. Um, in the previous episode, I looked at four important court cases um, over the last 65 years that have laid the foundation for where we're at today. Um, today, I actually want to discuss the Fisher vs. UT case, the facts of the case, and the context uh, for how and why Abigail Fisher sued the University of Texas in 2000. So in the year that she applied, there were approximately 29,500 applications. Of those applicants, uh, 12,843 were granted admission. More than 90% of those admits uh, from the state of Texas were admitted under the top 10% law. So this left very few spaces for applicants outside the top 10% uh, to gain admission. So for those applicants who did not gain admission under the top 10%, uh, there were two primary factors that are looked at. One is what's called academic achievement. Um, I've talked about these in previous episodes, but as a refresher, Academic achievement is a combination of, predict of a student's class rank and also their SAT or ACT scores in order to form a predicted GPA. So it's looking at academic criteria, what a student's done inside the classroom, in combination with personal achievement criteria. So the other half of this equation uh, looks at leadership and work experience, awards, extracurriculars, the resume, the essays, and so on. Um, but also within that personal achievement are important biographical factors. These are things like family income, uh, whether a student comes from a single parent family, the education levels of their parents, uh, whether that student speaks English as a second language, whether they come from an urban or rural environment, uh, whether they're male or female, um, and also the race of that student. So whenever you're applying to the university, on your Applied Texas application, it asks you point blank, are you Asian American, are you Hispanic, are you African American, and so on. Um, and so these are all the factors that constitute whether a student that year gained admission or not. Um, it's very much the same way as it is today, um, and that's in congruence with the 2003 decision um, in the, the Bollinger, the Grutter versus Bollinger case. Uh, so in 2008, Abigail Fisher uh, was a student in suburban Houston who brought a lawsuit, um, and actually with, with a co-plaintiff, challenging the use of, of admissions, uh, use of race in college admissions for UT. Uh, she claims that she was denied admission as an undergraduate student, um, and that there were uh, less qualified minority applicants who were taking place, uh, taking her spot and the spots of white students uh, at UT Austin. Uh, she was claiming discrimination in violation of Equal Protection Clause uh, in the 14th Amendment. Um, in fact, the lower courts ruled in favor of UT Austin, both at the, uh, the district court, um, but also at the, the court above that. And, uh, and they said that, that the process meets the appropriate but limited standard established in the Grutter case uh, for using race of admissions as one subset of a subset of a subset of a criteria. Uh, but moreover, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of times, especially in these big kind of national conversations that, that change policy nationwide, uh, are often supported by special interest groups. Um, Abigail Fisher is supported by a project called uh, the Project for Fair Representation based out of Washington, D.C. Um, the Project for, for Fair Representation was looking for the perfect plaintiff by which to challenge race in admissions. Um, in much the same way that Hopwood, in the 1996 case, uh, challenging race in the, in the use of UT law, um, she, Hopwood, Cheryl Hopwood was the perfect applicant, uh, perfect plaintiff, um, because her GPA and test scores were significantly higher than minority applicants, yet she was denied admission. Um, but in the case of Abigail Fisher, uh, you know, what UT is arguing is that, you know, B, she was outside the top 10%, her test scores were not very strong, and that even if she had received a perfect score on her personal achievement index, uh, the score being one to six, one is the lowest, six is the highest. Abigail Fisher did not score a six. Um, but even if she had received a, spur a perfect score uh, and gotten that six on her personal achievement, she still would not have been strong enough to gain admission to the University of Texas. So the argument in the Fisher case is not whether Fisher would be admitted or not. Uh, even Fisher agrees that, yeah, I just you know wasn't really a strong enough applicant. Um, yet she claims that it's sort of this bigger conversation about affirmative action. And so that's what the debate's really about. It's not about Fisher. Fisher is just kind of the representative of this, this kind of class of people who are claiming discrimination um, in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, so that's really what's being debated today. And it was fascinating because I was employed at UT Austin when the Supreme Court case was going on and when the oral arguments were heard and subsequently when the Supreme Court released their decision. Um, and, and, and it was a really interesting time because when the court case was released, I wasn't legally allowed to talk about the Fisher case. For instance, if there was a family at a college fair or, or a UT presentation, and they asked me, hey, it's like, what do you think about race and admissions? I could tell them how we use race and admissions based upon the ruling in, in the, the Grutter versus Bollinger case, but I couldn't speak on the Supreme Court case itself. 
um, which is why I wanted to make this series because this, now that I'm no longer employed, I can talk about um, the Fisher case and kind of what was going on behind the scenes. And so we heard the oral arguments, you know, Supreme Court justices were, were pretty skeptical and, and no one was really sure exactly you know, what the ruling was going to be, whether it was going to be ruled in favor of Fisher and against affirmative action or in favor of UT for the use of race and admissions um, in order to increase diversity. Um, but when the decision was released, like, everybody was actually really confused. Uh, the Supreme Court voted 7-1 to one, um, and sent it back down to the lower courts uh, under something called the application of strict scrutiny. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I can't speak on kind of the legal facts of the case. Um, but basically, the Supreme Court said the lower courts uh, didn't adjudicate the case correctly um, and basically to go and start all over again. So this is when 2013, um, in July 15, 2014, the Fifth Circuit uh, again ruled in favor of UT stating... Um, that it is equally settled that universities may use race as part of a holistic admissions program or may not otherwise achieve diversity. Um, so again, uh, district court said, hey, UT, you're in the right. And again, the Supreme Court case heard oral arguments again on December 9th, 2015. Um, this was about a month ago. Um, and we expect the decision to be released sometime uh, later this year. Um, no one's still really sure you know, what the decision's going to be. There's only eight justices that are ruling on this because one of the, the justices uh, recused herself, um, Elena Kagan recused herself, and she's not participating in the vote, um, much like she did in, in the 2013 decision. Um, so in the next installment, I want to talk about the actual arguments. You know, what's Fisher saying? What's the University of Texas saying? Kind of look at this overall picture of affirmative action, recognizing that it really isn't about Fisher. Um, and so I look forward to, to offering you guys both sides of the coin and allowing you more food for thought to, to continue thinking about this very important issue of using race and admissions within the overall context of uh, kind of race history, uh, social inequality, and access to higher education um, that I talked about in the first video um, dealing with, with uh, Supreme Court uh, decisions on affirmative action throughout American history. Uh, thanks, and I hope that you join me for the third installment of this uh, four-part series on the Fisher case.